We got this level all right. Oh, hell, just a minute. <laughs> Helen? <laughs> I, I'm doing the Balusi lecture right now. Oh, okay. Right. It's my wife, and she, she said to tell everyone to turn their cell phones off. <laughs> okay, thank you. Actually, she actually said that if anyone has a mind to, to use my laser and put out their eyes, but I don't think I should go that far. <laughs> I'm going to start off kind of slow and easy, reading a few pages, and then we'll get real. <laughs> I first want to thank uh, the association, needless to say, uh, for this honor. And I want to especially uh, thank my brother, William Hatcher, for introducing me to the faith, or the faith to me, and for assisting me through the years in many, many ways, particularly this book about which I'm going to speak tonight. The work I'm going to talk about tonight ultimately stems from an ABS conference 30 years ago, or at least from a paper I began to write 30 years ago. And so it's only appropriate that the final, I hope, volume in that series of three volumes, uh, Physical Reality, the Arc of Ascent and Close Connections, uh, is presented here tonight. When in uh, Tennyson's poem, the figure of Ulysses is about, he's, he's come home from the Trojan War and he has uh, realized that he's not a good ruler. He's a good adventurer, but he's a terrible ruler. And so he brings the people of Ithaca together and he has his son beside him. And he says to the people, I leave the island in the hands of my son Telemachus, who is a fit person to rule. He says, he has his work, I have mine. Well, I think as Baha'is, we all too often have to remind ourselves that everybody can do something, but not everybody can do everything. And so we have to choose where we serve according to the needs of the faith and according to our special capacities with which we have been endowed. So if my work has had any service, uh, it has uh, redoubled the joy that it brings me by the love and, uh, and joy I've had in actually going into the writing systematically. Because what you'll find if you read any of my work on uh, the faith is that uh, all I do is hook together passages from the writings. That's all I do. So if, if, you, you know, if you disagree with anything you're going to hear tonight, and there are a lot of things you're going to hear that you haven't heard before, some of you, go to the writings. I may be wrong. Or you can buy the book <laughs> and see where the source is. And if you don't like the book, then you can uh, dip it in acrylic and give it away as a yummy hot gift. It's a, <laughs> it's a beautiful cover. Um, well, I was going to read a couple of pages, but I'm, I'm already tired of, of being unspontaneous. So let me simply begin this way. We're talking this weekend about the attempt to discover how the study of science, or the study by scientists of reality, and the study of reality by religion and philosophy can somehow coalesce and be seen as complementary studies of one single reality. 
Now, as Baha'is, we have an incredible advantage as Baha'i scholars, if we are daring enough, because we have been given strategic answers to strategic questions. And while the whole world knows the questions, when did human life begin? Does the consciousness reside in the brain or is it non-local? Is there a metaphysical reality? Uh, what impels human history? Did we evolve from some other species? Thing after thing, what is the smallest particulate matter of creation? What's the largest expression? Is the Big Bang it? Did time begin, as Hawking says, with the Big Bang, so on? So we know the questions that humanity needs to answer to, to deal with strategic questions, not just about uh, academic issues, but real everyday matters, such as the issue of when, uh, when do we decide a, a human life is viable, and so on. And I've decided it's approximately age 16 if you, <laughs> if you can repeat, do you want fries with that? You know? <laughs> and can somehow subsist on a minimum wage, which is, of course, impossible. But at any rate, so maybe 21 would be the viability of the fetus. Uh, <laughs> well, the point is this. I'm going to read two, two quotes for you before I get to passages that will be on the screen so you can read them for yourself that are very dear to me and so far as going from the strategic question to strategic answers, making a bridge. Abu Baha, in one case, when he's given a strategic answer and some answered questions, says, the answer is short, by close reflection it shall be made long. <laughs> Meaning, I've given you the answer, now figure out how, how I got there. Uh, probably the most revealing passage in so far is this whole issue of what we as Baha'is attempting to be academics and scholars, how we can serve without becoming mindless or dogmatic, which serves nobody, is a statement by the Guardian which says the following, there is an answer in the teachings for everything. Unfortunately, the majority of the Baha'is, however intensely devoted and sincere they may be, lack for the most part the necessary scholarship and wisdom to reply to and refute the claims and attacks of people with some education and standing. So that means that even if we know the right answers and we know the right questions, unless we're capable of getting from one to the other with strategic bridges, we're not serving anyone. The f question that I began thinking about 30 years ago <laughs> was why the Creator thought that physical reality was a good way to train essentially spiritual beings so that we wake up into a world where we think we're physical and we're not, where we think we own stuff and we don't, and we're constantly worried about dying when we're already in the spiritual realm and don't know it. And so, in 1977, the first published effort of mine to reflect on this was called The Metaphorical Nature of Physical Reality, which was published by ABS, and uh, which essentially says physical reality is a means by which we can incrementally come to understand abstract concepts as they are expressed by the fact that everything in creation emanates from God and as Baha'u'llah says, everything in creation reflects attributes of God to the extent that it is capable of doing so. And without that capacity, it wouldn't exist. So in effect, as this concludes, physical reality is a classroom of carefully cleverly designed classroom. 
And the main thing I began thinking about, what started me with this, in part, was what's the hardest thing I can think of to ask God? Because as if Shoghi Effendi is correct, and the answer to any question you can answer uh, is in the writings, or any question you can ask, the answer is in the writings, then I wanted to think of what was the hardest thing I could ask. And, and I came up with, with this, you know, why physical reality? Why not some other way? Well, the next publication was 10 years later, The Purpose of Physical Reality. Many of you are familiar with that. That's probably my best seller so far. Well, and it's coming out again, and it's going to look uh, not like that. That's something else. <laughs> it's going to look like that in the fall when it comes out for trade publication, rewritten so that it's uh, not for a Baha'i audience. But the purpose of physical reality adds to this concept of physical reality as metaphorical or dramatic, where we're really just acting out. You know, we're acting out like this is really us when it's just a vehicle through which we operate. And we're acting like the things we do are really important when they're just exercises, you know. Um, one of the interesting things that I think comes out of that work is the very end of it where uh, oh. I've got to go to the previous slide, don't I? Now, go to the previous slide. There. Uh, this is a chart that shows the progress of the soul and intellect versus the progress of the body. Now, if you'll think, if you'll think of, of these timelines as sort of elastic fascia, tying the, the body trying to pull the soul down, but it's being ripped away. This is God's divine plan called aging. Uh, and it's an incredibly important teaching device when you think about it. It means you may want to be physical and you may want to stay young, but God has developed a device which will totally prohibit that successful <laughs> effort or that effort from being successful. And you'll see I've got the dandelion effect, which is really supposed to come up like that, but I hit it too soon. And what the dandelion effect is, Walt Whitman said that he wanted to be a leaf of grass. He wasn't very ambitious as a spiritual person. And he, uh, he said when he dies, his remains will dissociate and he will become decomposed and he will become a leaf of grass. And so I've decided I'm going to be a dandelion. Uh, so that's why I call it the dandelion effect. Now I hope the rest of me is, is doing better than that, but uh, at any rate. So the, the next thing I did was in 1994, uh, oh here, let's, let's do that right. The 1994, the Ark of Ascent. The central premise of that is simply this. Given now we have a classroom and we have a process for the classroom, which is aging and preparing ourselves for an easy transition to the next world. And Baha'u'llah says that's the sole purpose of this life, is so that transition is smooth and almost imperceptible. This says individual spiritual preparation is impossible by yourself, that we are essentially social beings and that individual development is impossible without working out these, well, you've got understanding and action, these twin pillars, to know and to do. Neither is acceptable without the other. But the doing has to involve other people. So you can have a hermit living in a cave who thinks he's extremely spiritual, and maybe everyone else thinks he's extremely spiritual. But how do we know until he comes out and does something spiritual? Uh, like serve on an LSA. Or, <laughs> Or 
Well, the third book is coming up right now, and that's 10 years later, and that's this one that's for sale in the bookstore. As I say, beautiful cover. It really is nice. And uh, uh, the purpose of this is to discuss this bridge that I began with. What is, it, it has essentially at, its, at the heart of the thesis is, if God is essentially spiritual as creator and is running the whole physical universe, then perhaps there's a comparable way in which our soul, which is essentially spiritual, is running our body. And so I study the process in large the same way Plato does in the Republic, where he wants to define justice in the individual. He says, well, first let's find it in the state where it's easily visible. And so uh, I begin by, in the first part of the book, discerning what we can know about how the creator runs physical creation, and then I compare it to how this works on the individual level. And so my talk, the unveiling of the Uri of love, or Huri of love, H is pronounced, I'm alive, I'm sorry, I forgot, means the white ones, the pure ones. The Huris are the things that, the, 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 the creatures, the unveiled, beautiful creatures that these young men who blow themselves up expect to uh, uh, encounter in the next world. Though they won't have the appendages necessary to enjoy them, I suspect. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, but Baha'u'llah describes a huri in very specific and unambiguous terms. A huri, says Baha'u'llah, is inner meaning. How many huris of inner meaning that are as yet concealed within the chambers of divine wisdom. None hath yet approached them, who raise whom no man nor spirit hath touched before. So these young men are going to be surprised when in the next world they're handed the Kitabi Igan, <laughs> uh, <laughs> which explicates all the abstruse verses of the Quran. Uh, and the who raise will be unveiled for them. So that's what it is. It's, you know, in the Baha'i faith, we don't worship mysteries. We solve them. We were asked to dissolve them, not, not adore them. And so the purpose of unveiling the Huri is to discover the inner meaning thereof. So what's the inner meaning of love? Well, we begin with a very simple premise as enunciated and articulated in the Hadith of the Hidden Treasure, an ancient tradition in the Islamic tradition which is spoken of a great deal by both Abdu'l Baha and Baha'u'llah we could spend hours going over this tradition. Suffice it to say, it states in the voice of the creator, I wanted to be known, so I brought creation into being that I might be known. Now from that simple statement, you can deduce everything we know in the Baha'i writings. But Baha'u'llah helps us by spelling out in some hidden words a little more about this way in which the Creator wants to be known, which necessarily involves a process of being known. Because involved in these hidden words is love. He doesn't want to be known only, but loved. Well, of course, the knowing will induce the love. So one follows the other. O son of man, veiled in my immemorial being and in the ancient eternity of my essence, I knew my love for thee. Therefore I have created thee and engraved on thee mine image and revealed to thee my beauty. Now my image, as the writings explained, means our capacity to think abstractly and to understand attributes and to acquire attributes by acting them out. And the will to pursue this endeavor. So we add one little ingredient to the hidden treasure. The creator doesn't just want to be known, the creator wants to be love. Now love, interestingly, like education and many other important acts, cannot be accomplished by coercion. 
they must involve free will on the person you're trying to educate. You can get people to act as if they have understood and acquired information, to parrot information back to you, but that's not education. That's rehearsing someone else's education. Same thing with love. You can get people to act in all kinds of humiliating ways to demonstrate their love for you, but there's nothing you can do to coerce real, sincere, authentic affection. Now love, Abdu Baha says in the, one of these wonderful passages, is the cause of God's revelation unto man. So here we get a little further into the hidden treasure. Though it's really just reiterating the hidden treasure. I wanted to be known, so I brought creation into being. I wanted to be known and loved, so I brought creation. And love is in effect the reason for creation and it is also a law of creation. Now, we're used to it as Abdu'l Baha says here, is the vital bond that draws things of physical reality together. So things are attracted according to their mass and proximity. Spiritual things are attracted according to their proximity and their capacity to manifest the attributes of God. The more attributes and the more complexly they're manifested, the more attraction you've got. So we see an exact parallel between physical and metaphysical reality. Now, getting back to our initial problem of conjoining physical science and spiritual uh, understanding, we have then certain theses which I derive largely from a statement in my brother's book, Minimalism, where he observes something to the following effect. Science possesses, or thinks it possesses, very exact knowledge about very discrete portions of reality which it thus studies as a modular system. Modular meaning a system that is stuck together, each piece autonomous, and they somehow are stuck together and they work together. Whereas philosophy and religion possess, or think they possess, very inexact knowledge about the entirety of reality which they study as a holographic system. That is, the whole thing is one idea which the creator has created so that it is one coordinated and integrated whole. Stated even more succinctly, science offers a bottom-up view of reality while philosophy and religion offer a top-down view. And of course the idea is how do we get these complementary ingredients to realize they're really looking at the same reality? Well, we're gonna see in a minute. My objective in this talk and in this book is to offer a synthesized or integrative view of these ostensibly opposing but potentially complementary approaches to reality. Now what you see before you is a very interesting example of the problem of this antithesis between science and religion's approach to the same reality. You know, we can always use the, the hackneyed uh, analogy of the various people blindfolded or blinded and touching the various parts of the elephant and think they're describing totally different things. But rather than elephant, let's, this is particle science. Now this is a very interesting thing that happened to me. Two weeks after I handed in the manuscript, I went to a lecture by Frank Wilczek, who works down the street at MIT. He won the Nobel Prize last year <clears throat> for his work in quantum chromodynamics. And what was interesting to me, among other things, was he showed a picture of a quark splitting into three parts, a quark, an antiquark, and a gluon. These guys are real poets, you know. Uh, <laughs> uh, But suffice it to say, I had to run back and call uh, uh, Terry Cassidy and say, hold the presses, they just split a quark. Because I had quoted another Nobel Prize winner from nine years ago who said, we'd probably never split a quark. So, you know, I said, well, I should have known better. But suffice it to say that in this picture, which he was nice enough to, uh, to send to me via email, uh, taken at the CERN laboratory of two particles being exploded, crashed together, and 
there you see the results and it's beautiful. Uh, and he said in his lecture that this might possibly be an interesting example of what the Big Bang looked like and its inception. Now it's interesting in two ways. One, because Abu Baha says every particular system or minor system or small system emulates and imitates the functioning of every large system. And so, and as Abdul Baha says, you know, like an atom can be a model, model of the solar system and so on. So here you have particle physics showing a relationship to celestial uh, study. But that's not the, the interesting thing. The interesting thing is that in the questions that followed, I said, I'm sorry to ask anything because I'm an English major, but uh, if it took all this engineering and planning and power to cause these particles to come together, how come the Big Bang could happen without a similar cause? How can you have an effect without a sufficient cause? Well, his response was very interesting. He didn't respond to the question. He gave me a story, which means you know you're in trouble because you're going to be some character in the story who's ignominious in some way. And so the story was about what is apparently, according to my brother, a very well-known and famous anecdote that I'd never heard before. They, they don't talk about it in the English department. But apparently the great scientist Laplace, who wrote a book called Mé Mécanique Celestial, uh, was asked by Napoleon, who perused the book, why is there no mention of God? And Laplace uh, said with a, I don't know, I was going to say with a smile, but we don't really know. He probably was very polite. Uh, he, he said, because I didn't need God to complete my hypothesis. Now here we see the reality of what my brother was talking about, that science don't tell me about the Big Bang. I don't need to know. I'm splitting a quark and I did it. You know, and I got the Nobel Prize. So you go worry about what preceded the Big Bang. He told the same thing to a guy who asked about super string theory. He says, not my area. You know, I don't have to worry about that. I can split a quark. And, uh, <laughs> Now, looking at this from a larger perspective, we see that contemporary philosophy or what is passing for contemporary philosophy and religion, which is primarily people like Tony Robbins and Dwayne, uh, Wayne Dwyer and Eckhart Tolle and uh, Joel Osteen, these people are interested in helping you find your inner power. And they speak in, and Deepa Chopra, for example, even talks about proving the existence of God. The problem that they, they don't deal with is they presume that you're only interested in feeling good and powerful right now. They're not really worried about what you're going to feel like in, in 30 or 40 years. They also don't mention the fact that the way to feel really good is to give seminars on how to feel good and make a lot of money and buy an island somewhere. You know. But at any rate, the fact is that they also are neglecting the body politic as a whole. It's existential and it's individual. There is no collective plan for humankind. So what you get is then the Tony Robbins uh, phil philosophical approach of the top-down view. Uh, and you get Frank Wilczek, who actually looks like that. Uh, and a uh, very nice person, he really is, uh, who can split a quark. <laughs> I could have used Wayne Dwyer, but he's terribly bald. I could have used Deepa Chopra, but I actually have some respect for him. Uh, so I used Tony Robbins because of his teeth. He has the most incredible teeth I've ever seen. <laughs> now, 
If God is all powerful, we come to this question. And this is in a sense of a variation on the question I began this whole interest in 30 years ago. If God wants to be known, why isn't he? If God's methodology works, why aren't we spiritual? He can be, we know that, by simply kun fa yakunu, be and it is. He has that power. But again, remember that the nature of the way he wants to be known necessitates an indirect process whereby people voluntarily come to know and then to love God. Why? Because it's beneficial to them to do so. The only thing I can think of close to our understanding this is, in a way is having children. You know, people who can't have children will do anything to have children. There is something in us that loves loving, creating, and loving that which we create. So God could do this. In fact, there is a passage in the writings which says, within the treasury of our wisdom there lieth unrevealed a knowledge, one word of which, if we chose to divulge it to mankind, would have caused every human being to recognize the manifestation of God and to acknowledge his omniscience and would enable everyone to discover the secrets of all sciences and to attain so high a station as to find himself wholly independent of all past and future learning. It could happen. So why doesn't it? Well, <laughs> my line out didn't work, Jeff. Let's try it again. A little louder, Jeff. There we go. <laughs> I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember Captain Marvel, but Billy Batson was a 16-year-old kid in the comic books about 50, 60 years ago, and all he'd have to say is Shazam, which was the name of this Egyptian wizard. And he would go, Shazam, and suddenly he would become Captain Marvel. <laughs> so if he could do that, God could utter kun fa yakuno and bring about whatever he wanted. And of course, that's kind of sexist, so we need to go to <laughs> Captain and Mary Marvel and the whole Marvel clan. Now, what is James Dyson doing in this picture? He's making a vacuum cleaner, very good. And it's a, it's a darn good vacuum cleaner. It costs twice as much as any Hoover, but it's well worth it because it has a lifetime guarantee and if it ever breaks, he will come to your house and say, your life is over and he will he will get a laser and shoot you. <laughs> well, why is James Dyson in this picture? Because if we were suddenly produced in the condition that God wants us to be in, we had realized that we were waking into a condition without any history and without the tools to get any further. We would all be nice and loving and smiling and no backbiting and we'd all have Dyson vacuum cleaners, but if it broke and he didn't shoot you, you'd have to figure out how to fix it, you know, and you wouldn't know how. So in other words, if God said, kun fa yakunu, and we are, here we are. Now what do we do? And we don't know because we don't have any way of knowing how we got here, therefore we don't know how to go from here to any place else. So there's a value in getting there. Now here's an interesting thing that occurs. You have a concept by fundamentalist uh, religious groups, some, which believe that, the, that creation began 6,000 years ago with the advent of Adam. And God empowered Adam and thus began the human race. Now what's interesting in this is not only does it mean that 
creation just suddenly occurred to the creator is, I know what, I'm kind of bored today. I think I'll create something. You know, if the creator has desired to be known, he has always desired to be known. Abdul Baha says this very clearly. But what's interesting is this, is you have this sort of obscene alliance between fundamentalism and contemporary physicists. Because you have the idea of a single event that occurred 16 billion years ago. All right? Now, the Big Bang, or the not so Big Bang. Because the fact is that, how do you posit the theory that nothing preceded the Big Bang? Well, it's totally untenable and illogical, I realize, but they believe this. They really believe this. I'll show you later what really happened. But <laughs> one of the things that we have as individuals and science has always had, and that is a fear of infinity. If we think there are infinite human beings on infinite planets, there must be infinite manifestations of God ministering to those infinite planets. Well, you can't read much of some answered questions without deducing that. It's inescapable, that conclusion. There have always been human beings, says Abdul Baha, because that's the fruit of creation, and the creator without a creation is impossible, it's untenable. That makes us nervous. It makes us nervous when we go to a football game and think that God cares for all of these 100,000 people as much as he does for me. And we really, on some level, we say, yeah, we accept that. But we really don't. You know, we really think somehow that whole stadium is focused on us. You know? But what we don't realize is there are a bunch of other people thinking the same thing, and they're excluding you from their uh, universe. You know? So what we need to do is embrace infinity. And it's hard to do, and I don't have a short answer for you right now. Uh, but suffice it to say that as Baha'is, spiritual beings operating temporarily in this gestational period of our physical development and preparation for a more expansive experience in the world to come, we better get used to the idea and find some way that it is not only acceptable but wonderful. Well, we get to the nature of love, which is the heart of our discussion. But before we can discuss love as the process by which we come to know the Creator, namely the bridge that we're talking about between the Creator and us, we need to, uh, to look at, first of all, this quote, that love is the most great law. And again, this statement of love as the principle by which all physics and all human relationships work. We have to notice where we are before we can get there. And where we are is in a society that thinks love is a, an event beyond your willful control. And so if someone falls in love, it's not their fault. Even if they're already married to someone else or, uh, you know, it's, I'm sorry, honey, I fell in love. And uh, so I'll see you, I'll keep in touch with the kids. It's all right, dear, you couldn't help it. You fell in love and you fell out of love with me. Well. I like to call this the, the idea of waiting to be hit by the escalate of love. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like an, a traffic accident, you know? You don't want it to happen and so on, but it, it's not your fault. It was an accident. It happened. I fell in love. And so I, it's actually pronounced escalade, I know. But you stand there in the middle of the highway, you know, waiting to be hit and have that nice Cadillac imprint on your forehead. <laughs> you know, God forbid it should be a Hyundai or something. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and so you fall. 
helplessly in love. <laughs> but of course, as I said, if you can fall in love beyond your free will, you fall out of love in the same way. And so the escalate of love drives off and leaves you standing there. There it goes. And so you wait there until there's a new improved escalate of love. <laughs> this one is, uh, I think, uh, Midnight Blue. Well, <laughs> I think it matches her dress. <laughs> I'm going to read you a passage about our contemporary neurotic views of love from a book by Denis de Richemont called Love in the Western World. It's a wonderful book. Uh, it's written in the 40s, actually, and, uh, but it discusses the fact that it is his theory that falling in love is a myth we derive from the medieval metrical romance and the concept of courtly love, and the fact that love is only love when you can't have it. That obstacle is essential to maintaining this ecstatic passion. Very much like the description of the Sufi poets, you know, of the love of the friend, but you can't really attain the station of the friend or, this, or this, the proximity of the friend. So there's intense longing. Uh, I remember when my dear friend Coleman Barks, uh, with whom I taught at Georgia and uh, we're constantly in, uh, in uh, email exchanges. When he was interviewed by Bill Moyers and Moyers was asking him about Rumi and about this concept of e ecstatic love and longing. And Moyers, who's eminently reasonable and fine and smart, said, so what happens next? What, why the ecstatic longing? He said, what do you do then? He said, well, you, you try to do it again. In other words, the longing itself is the reason for the longing because it feels so good to feel so bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure Coleman wouldn't mind my telling a joke about him, but at any rate, the myth of falling in love operates wherever passion is dreamed of as an ideal instead of being feared like a malignant fever, imagined as a magnificent and desirable disaster instead of simply a disaster. It lives upon the lives of people who think that love is their fate and is unavoidable as the effect of the love potion in the romance, that it swoops upon powerless and ravaged men and women in order to consume them in a pure flame, or that it is stronger and more real than happiness, society, or morality. Very, very smart and accurate analysis, I think. Obstacle is everything. Without the obstacle, there's no love. Because once you get together, <laughs> what are you going to describe her picking up his socks or, you know, uh, or cleaning the car or, you know, all love stories end when they finally overcome the obstacle and get together. If you're going by paradigm number one, the happy love. You know, uh, the Sleeping Beauty, uh, Cinderella, so on. The obstacles are overcome, they get together, and they live happily ever after. And if they don't, we don't want to hear about it. <laughs> well, it just can't get any better than this, so let's end the story. But you have a second syndrome or paradigm, which I call the Seinfeld syndrome, <laughs> which is that because it feels so good, that first aura of new love, you want to do it again when it wears off. And so you do it again and again and again and again and again until finally you, you get tired of it. You know? <laughs> and you get jaded and you start taking drugs or something that's more interesting. Well, the third paradigm is the tragic ending. And these we really love because I don't know why. I, I don't, I'm not crazy about them myself. But the, the classic version, of course, is Romeo and Juliet. Now, if you divide Romeo and Juliet up into the essential ingredients, you first of all have love at first sight. 
which is essential in courtly love tradition. Did my heart love till now forswear its sight, for I never saw true beauty till this night. That's what Romeo says when he goes to the ball to prove to Benvolio that his beloved Rosalind is more fair than any of the other ladies there until he sees Juliet across the room and says, forget it, Rosalind. I love her. You know. She's really hot. Well, <laughs> it's the same thing you see going on out in the halls. <laughs> And, uh, and I don't blame him a bit. <laughs> but the idea that he can assess her attributes by looking is that, you know, I always wish that he would come up to her and she would smile and not have her teeth or something. <laughs> or say, hi, what's your sign? <laughs> but she turns out to be very witty and they in, uh, engage in a battle of wits where they have puns and all this stuff. Uh, but it turns out that he is Romeo and a Montague. And she's bemoaning as she sticks her head out her window of her balcony and says, why do you have to be Romeo? Why, aren't you, why can't you be something else? A rose by any other name would smell as sweet. Well, there's your obstacle. Here's your rendezvous. People think that courtly love is non-sexual, it's platonic. No, I'm afraid that's wrong. It's entirely focused on the next time they get together. So here, they've spent the night together. Um, uh, your parents will tell you what that means later. Right? <laughs> uh, and she is so in love that she doesn't want him to go, and so you have what's called the abad, which is the morning song. And they hear the lark of morning heralding the day, and she says, no, it's not the lark, it's the nightingale. Well, he knows if he gets caught, he's gonna get killed. He says, it's not the nightingale, it's the lark, and he goes. Now, the problem is, of course, the plot thickens, she uh, is thought to be dead. The messenger gets trapped, doesn't get to Romeo. He goes to the tomb to mourn the loss of his beloved Juliet, who's not really dead, she's just drugged. He thinks he really is. He takes poison and he dies. And she wakes up, sees he's dead, sticks a dagger in her chest, and she's dead. And so you have the end of the play. Now, according... According to Abdu'l Baha, none of these paradigms, which are really events, they're not really processes, they're not really relationships, none of these is authentic love. And I'm not going to read this quote because you're all familiar with it, I know. But he, he says in two passages in his discussion of love and, and some answered questions that this kind of thing we call love does exist. It's simply not love, not by itself. Today you will see two souls apparently in close friendship. Tomorrow this may be changed. Yesterday they were ready to die for one another. Today they shun one another's society. This isn't love. It is the yielding of the hearts to the accidents of life. Now, what we need to realize then, as Baha'u'llah discusses in Seven Valleys and elsewhere, is that love is a process. And this is where we go back to our thesis. I wish to be known, therefore I bought creation into being that I might be known, but by known in a particular way. Again, remember, you can't coerce someone to learn something. You can't coerce someone to, to love you. What you can do is provide opportunity. So you need time and you need stages of development or progress. That's the ladder of love. It's from Plato's Symposium. If we go back down, we can imagine that these are equivalent to the seven valleys of Baha'u'llah, where you search for the beloved, you catch a scent of the friend or the beloved in the mystical tradition, 
Uh, and so you are, have this blinding attraction, this affection, this infatuation. And then you want to know, if you have any sense, what it is you're attracted to. Because if you're not in a condition of health, you could be attracted to someone who's not good for you. Just as if you're uh, in training uh, as an athlete, you will be automatically attracted to foods that are nourishing and good for you. But if you're unhealthy, you'll be attracted to precisely what's bad for you. That's why Baha'u'llah has the law of parental consent. All right? Because sometimes we can tell when you're not healthy and we know that you're making a bad choice. But you don't see it. But if you have any sense, you'll extricate yourself from the claws of the eagle of love long enough to assess what it is you're attracted to do, to, to see if it's worthy, healthy, and then you'll proceed through the other stages. Or in Christian and Islamic mysticism, you also have these same kind of ascending stages that are described by any number of mystics in the medieval period and, and other periods as well of ever more intensive um, experience of nearness to the divine, usually that uh, have an index of some physical experience. Uh, I've listed these, these are just arbitrary that I listed, but you begin, say, with the search for the beloved, you feel attracted to the beloved, you found a scent of the beloved, to use Sufi terms. You study the beloved to see what it is you're attracted to. You achieve some state of understanding of the beloved and why you're attracted. Or in the case of another person, what qualities of that person remind you of the beloved. And you then attain a sense of something more important than intellectual comprehension of that attraction, but a sense of I've, uh, I've satisfied my intellectual curiosity, and you feel a, a union with that. Again, you, you compare this uh, very importantly with your progress in the faith as you go through the various stages of love for the faith. Love the characteristics of the beloved and others, then love the others for themselves. Union with others. Love the ultimate source of all attributes. And then ultimately, as it's variably described in the hidden word, I mean, in the Seven Valleys and other mystical writings, the state of fana, or total selflessness, uh, true poverty and absolute nothingness. The loss of self, which is really a fulfillment of self. Now, how are we doing so far? Well, <laughs> our planet, according to most geophysicists is 5.9 billion years old. And according to the writings, we are in the midst of reaching maturation. So we did the geophysical part. We did the rocks. We got nice rocks. We've got uh, <laughs> diamonds and all kinds of really pretty rubies and things. Plants, exotic plants. Uh, animals we're not doing real well with. We're losing a lot of them, uh, but the ones we've got are very nice. I particularly like the cows. Uh, human physical evolution, we did that, been there, done that. Intellectual evolution, we're very smart. Einstein proved that, and, uh, and unfortunately he was later disproven, but by even more smart people. And we have human spiritual evolution, which is in progress. So uh, we're waiting for the lesser peace. <laughs> we're hoping that the, uh, that, or at least I'm hoping I'll be able to see it. I've been waiting for it since the Cuban Missile Crisis, which I thought, <laughs> I thought would do it for sure. Didn't, didn't do it. Well, let's analyze these stages on a collective level. Attraction. Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha state that inherent in our creation is the love of reality. We are inherently attracted to stuff. Why? Because, very simply, all stuff reflects the attributes of God. That's why we're attracted to it. So sometimes that attraction is perverted or distorted and so on, but that's what attracts us to anything that attracts us, ultimately. 
because it's inherent. Look at the, the, the uh, look at the computer. Here, let me go to the previous one here. God, last sentence, God has created or deposited this love of reality in man. We love reality inherently. In other words, it's not a choice we have. We're created that way. And we love it, as I said, because everything reminds us of that from which we emanated as a breath of spirit from God. Stage two, understanding our knowledge. Notice the clause of the eagle of love. Love in the sense that Derugemont is describing it does exist. You do get struck down by it. These attractions occur. They're not imagined. But what you do with them then? Well, if it's a healthy love, you investigate it. And you, by escaping from the clause of the eagle of love, that doesn't make love sound like a really sweet, nice thing, does it? Well. It requires free will to do that. It's not just going to happen. This is why the law of chastity is so important. You know, once you're enmeshed in a physical relationship, you can't step back and say, well, let me see what objectively I feel about this. <laughs> yeah, you're going to be very objective. Uh, so free will is very important. And to illustrate this, I chose a poem by John Donne called Batter My Heart. And it's an interesting poem because the speaker which is not really John Donne, but a character he creates. John Donne is a very smart guy. This is a very ironic poem. And he's saying, God, I try, I try. I love you, I really do. But I am so ensnared by attraction to things antithetical to you, I can't seem to exert enough free will. So batter my heart. He compares himself to a walled city. Batter my heart, three-person God, for you as yet but knock, breathe, shine, and seek to mend, that I may rise and stand or throw me and bend your force to break, blow, burn, and make me new. I, like a usurped town to another do, labor to admit you, but oh, to no end. Reason your viceroy in me, me should defend, but is captive and proves weak or untrue. So you have these images of great power. Batter my or throw me, break, blow, burn, make me new, divorce me, imprison me, ravish me. Great irony there. I will be chased if you ravish me. So he's in effect asking God to take over. <laughs> His own duty. Um, John Dunn would be pleased at your applause. Uh, <laughs> one of the more intriguing books I came across in my research in doing this book, which includes discussions of particle physics, astrophysics, evolution, all kinds of other proofs and uh, problems and so on, is a book called The Illusion Free Will. It was published last year by a professor at Harvard, but by MIT Press which should tell you something right there. <laughs> but <clears throat> what's interesting is what Wegner says is that, and if any of you are students of his, I'm sorry, but it's, it's not a very good book. Uh, he says that, <laughs> that as a particle physicist, he can hardly accept the existence of metaphysical reality, let alone metaphysical reality having an influence on physical reality. Because then, when Wilczek is splitting a quark, he'd have to say, I sure hope the people at the Deepa Chopra seminar aren't praying for this because it could affect the outcome. <laughs> you know? How would you know as a physicist if metaphysical influences 
can affect physical events, how would you know that your results are correct? So what he says is we can't possibly have will, I mean, in the sense of a metaphysical force that actually does stuff because it would have to be a metaphysical force and it would have to exert its influence on physical reality. So what he says is we have an authorship emotion. In other words, it's a post hoc event or emotion that occurs when we, you know, I sure felt like I did that, you know, <laughs> but it was just, I felt that emotion that I did it right after that thing moved and it was, I had the sensation of doing it, but I didn't cause it. So. What I realized is that Wick Wagner could not possibly have written the book, you know, <laughs> because he could, would have had to, well, let's put it this way. What I came up with was the Wagner profitability investment strategy, <laughs> whereby if we all gather tomorrow and go down to MIT Press, we can claim our fair share <laughs> of the royalties from the book because we have the emotion that we wrote the book. I'm going to donate my portion to a, a chair, uh, not a, f a chair, a professorial chair, but a, a rocking chair <laughs> for postmodernist theorists in their po old postmodernist -mod home <laughs> where they rock on the front porch because they have deconstructed themselves and don't think they exist anymore. Uh, and, and one of them will stand up and say, I rock, therefore I am. <laughs> well, Baha'u'llah says that we not only have free will, we not only have a classroom that is full of opportunities, but we are accountable for this, each of us for recognizing what it is that we're supposed to do, namely to know and to love God. Now, how can that be? Well, we're missing one ingredient, and that is you can have the capacity to do this and to understand this. You can be in a classroom replete with evidence of creator and design, but you still need someone more intelligent than you are to prime you, to get you started. And this, of course, is true in any traditional classroom situation. And it's, clue, it's true for humanity as a whole. And so we have the process for bringing about guidance in our love of God. And the problem is the gap. And I'm not, I know that's blue denim, but I don't mean the, <laughs> the store here. Uh, the problem is that we need a means by which the Holy Spirit can traverse that gap between metaphysical reality and us in physical reality. And the way in which that is done is the process between the command, kum, be, and it is. You remember when Abu Baha was placing the cornerstone at the temple in Wilmat, he said the temple is already built, which meant he could see the end in the beginning. And he knew that in effect, there was sufficient will and determination that he could, in, he knew that it, in effect it was done. Well, in one sense, we're talking about, but then we had 40 years of building it to put it in effect. Well, we're talking about what happens in between. So we begin with the divine will or wish to be known, going back to the hidden treasure again, we have the creation of an ever advancing civilization, not people in one static place with their Dyson vacuum cleaners, but in process, because the Baha'i definition of salvation is not a certain point of attainment. It is being in motion, in forward motion. So anywhere you go from where you are that's forward is salvation. Uh, and so you need a way of getting that power to civilization, and of course the way you do that is with the intermediary of translating that into that, replicating, as Christ said, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. So you have this top-down view of how do we make this earth resemble the heavenly realm and its attributes? And you do that with the intermediary, and of course the intermediary 
is a means by which the Holy Spirit is transmuted and translated into terms we can understand. And so you need a human form with whom we can converse and understand. Because if it just suddenly a blast of, of uh, some sort occurred and so on, we couldn't intuit this information. And so in crucial times, you need two of these. <laughs> and if you squint your eyes, you'll see that that's what Abdul Baha did when he designed the ring symbol. He shows a top down view of replicating perfection, Baha, as it is in heaven on earth by means of the intermediary of the Holy Spirit descending through the manifestation. However, and this is very important, this is something you might not have thought of before. That's a subordinate relationship and it's verified by this quote that you're all familiar with. Know thou that the kingdom is the real world, and this nether place is only its shadow stretching out. A shadow hath no life of its own. Its existence is only a fantasy and nothing more. It is but images reflected in water and seeming as pictures to the eye. So this dust heap, this, this is nothing, this world, and so on. So you have that, but then you have the antithesis of it. And that is, if you'll notice in the corners of the shrine of the Bab, the symbol is arranged in a counterpoint relationship so that it's not so much one above the other, but you have them corresponding to each other. Now listen carefully, because this gets interesting. Here's the quote that supports that view. The spiritual world is like unto the phenomenal world. They are the exact counterpart of each other. Whatever objects appear in this world of existence are the outer pictures of the world of heaven. Now imagine that. That means every single attribute or combination of attributes that can exist in spiritual reality must necessarily have an expression in physical reality. Which means what? Physical reality has to be infinite. Now imagine that's infinity. Let me go back and do it again for you. Here we are in the realm of the spirit. It's going all the way past the screen over there and all the way that way for infinity and that way and that way and every other way. It's infinite. It's infinite. But if physical reality is a counterpart relationship, it's got to be infinite too. It's like the outer garment of, of the physical world, the visible aspect of spiritual reality not a separate reality. Now, if you think of the fact that we are souls right now, we're really breaking the laws of all modern contemporary physicist theories right now by speaking soul to soul. All right? Because you're willfully listening, I hope, uh, and I'm willfully speaking, I think. All right? And all kinds of complex things have to go through the intermediary by which this comes into speech, to sound, goes through these speakers sometimes and reaches your ears. And so we are souls populating the spiritual world, but we can't see that realm. It's concealed from us. So long as we have an associative relationship through the brain with physical reality. We feel like we're physical. We feel like our thinking is right here. Though Baha'u'llah says the mind, the conscious mind associates with the brain, but it is not in the brain or of the brain any more than the soul, even though it associates with the body, is dependent on the body. And so, if you will, we are still spiritual souls operating in the guise of a physical situation. And so we relate to each other as best we can in this, but veiled from the fact that in the twinkling of an eye, that physical reality, once someone hits you with an escalade of death, <laughs> the Hyundai of death, uh, you suddenly, as Baha'u'llah said, in the twinkling of an eye, this whole illusion of your being physical 
is shattered and you are made aware. There's no longer an associative relationship. So, here's where it gets even more interesting. So play it, pay attention again. I mean, not that you haven't been, you're doing, doing great. Uh, three stages of assistance before incarnation, during incarnation, after incarnation. The manifestations are assisting us before they're incarnate. The prophets, unlike us, are pre-existent. The soul of Christ existed in the spiritual world before his birth in this world. We cannot imagine what that world is like, so words are inadequate to picture his state of being. Pre-existent knowledge. By the one true God, we read the tablet ere it was revealed while you were yet unaware, and we had perfect knowledge of the book when you were yet unborn. They choose where they're going to become manifest. The primary reason why the Bab and Baha'u'llah chose to appear in Persia, and you Persians might not want to read this. <laughs> uh, it's not good. Uh, we'll skip over that. <laughs> they choose the persona through which they will become manifest. The disillusion of the tabernacle wherein the soul of the manifestation of God had chosen temporarily to abide. He chose not only to do this, but, and this is my personal opinion, totally personal speculation, it may be one of the meanings of the Suri Hekel, the construction of, yeah, of the physical vehicle through which he's about to operate. Uh, I don't think that's all it means. It's a very complex work, but it's interesting to think about. Stage two, during incarnation. Well, we don't need to spend a lot of time on that. We're all familiar with that. He brings new laws. His own person exemplifies his own uh, uh, revelation. But this is another important thing that some, many Baha'is are not keenly aware of, and that is, from the beginning, that holy reality is conscious of the secrets of existence, and from the age of childhood, signs of a greatness appear and are visible in him. Therefore, how can it be that all these bounties and perfections he should have, with these he should have no consciousness? Or to put it, uh, this again, uh, the, the person of the manifestation is one of the uh, proofs of his station. Uh, uh, very important. In other words, their manifestations before they come, they are aware they're going to do it. They're aware when they're here of who they are. One explanation of their omniscience. Now, this is interesting. They are omniscient. Since the sanctified realities, the supreme manifestations of God, surround the essence and qualities of the creatures, transcend and contain existing realities, and understand all things, therefore, their knowledge is divine knowledge and not acquired. That is to say, it is a holy bounty. It is a divine revelation. They are omnipotent at will. As Baha'u'llah says in page 32 of the Epistle of the Son of Wolf, I think it is, that don't talk about the miracles we performed. It's, it's uh, not the kind of proof we need to utilize or we want. Why? If the prophet said, I am going to be uh, my name is going to be Baha'u'llah, I will appear in Tehran in the year so-and-so, what proof of understanding would be adduced by someone discovering the prophet? None. So they're concealed. During their lifetime, lifetimes, they are concealed. So the only ones who will find them are those who are attuned to what it is they're looking for. Here's another really mind-boggling thing the creativity of the prophet. We're used to speaking of the prophet as the mouthpiece of God, which of course in one sense he is. But it is clear in the writings that the prophet plays an artistic or creative role, not only in his language, but in everything else he does. Not ours, the living witness of the all subduing potency of his faith to question for a moment, and however dark the misery that enshrouds the world, the ability of Baha'u'llah to forge with the hammer of his will, his will, and through the fire of tribulation upon the anvil of this travailing age, and in the particular shape his mind 
has envisioned these scattered and mutually destructive fragments into which a perverse world has fallen, into one single unit, solid and indivisible, able to execute his design for the children of men. So you see that the guardian says the manifestation is not just someone who suddenly transformed and struck by the revelation and just opens a mouth and, and words come out. He works at this. He works at this. Why? He's not an ordinary human being. They are not transformed into manifestations. This is critical, friends, that you understand this. Because if not, you will run into, or could very well run into, the same dilemma that Christians did when they made Christ God. You don't want to make the manifestations human. They aren't. Not ordinary human beings. For a time, they work through a human vehicle. Briefly, the holy manifestations have ever been and ever will be luminous realities. No change or variation takes place in their essence before declaring their mission. They, uh, uh, they, excuse me, before declaring their mission, they are silent and quiet like a sleeper. And after their manifestation, they speak and are illumined like one who is awake. And so the function of this guidance then through the manifestations is sometimes compared to a mirror, a perfect mirror through which the attributes of God can be made manifest to us. But I have heard sometimes use the analogy that we who are finite cannot stand to behold the infinite and therefore we can't look up at God because he's too brilliant and bright and mind-boggling, but we can look at God through this perfect mirror. Well, that doesn't make any sense, does it? Because if it's a perfect mirror, it's just as blinding as the source of that perfect mirror. Right? So you've got to not mix the metaphors. The perfect mirror image is used, but it's in Abdul Baha's discussion of the distinction between manifestation and emanation. It might be better sometimes if in your teaching the, you use the, Im, ma, uh, the image of the mirror to describe the fact that the most perfect image of God we get is through the manifestation. But one image I found very useful is the prism metaphor. And that is this Holy Spirit is made understandable to us. The attributes visible to us through the manifestation. Now, one thing interesting about this, let me see how, how, how long have I been doing this? Too long? All right, we'll go, go a little longer. Um, I, don't, I don't want to bore you, but this is exciting stuff for me, needless to say. What's interesting about this metaphor, beside the fact that it's taking the pure white light that really is incomprehensible to us and giving it discernible attributes, is that the prism is infinite. And that is, you have here with this red line, the visible, at the visible aspects of the prism. Right. Going in either direction, infinitely, infinitely longer towards uh, the left in this, in this particular chart, or infinitely shorter uh, towards gamma rays and x-rays and so forth to the right. Which means, <clears throat> the, again, the manifestation infinitely and perfectly reflects all the attributes of God. Stage three of assistance. He's helping us now. Well, we know that. But look at this. We've all read these before. <clears throat> but they take on another significance when you think of it in these stages. In my presence among you there is a wisdom, and in my absence there is yet another, inscrutable to all but God, the incomparable, the all-knowing. Verily we behold you from our realm of glory and shall aid whosoever will arise for the triumph of our cause with the host of the concourse on high and a company of our favored angels. Another quote that's similarly astounding. 
Now, this is a longer version of a quote I gave you earlier, where the guardian talks about the fact that once released from this associative relationship with the figure that he chose to work through, the power of Baha'u'llah was unleashed and could, uh, well, let me just read it. The dissolution of the tabernacle, wherein the soul of the manifestation of God had chosen temporarily to abide, signalized its release from the restrictions which an earthly life had of necessity imposed upon it. Its influence no longer circumscribed by any physical limitations, its radiance no longer be clouded by its human temple, that soul could henceforth energize the whole world to agree unapproached at any stage in the course of its existence on this planet. Okay, that's important to know. Well, this I'll skip over a, a bit, but th this is something you all know because it's discussed fully in uh, the Egon, namely that the closest we get to attaining the presence of God is attaining the proximity to the manifestation, which itself is not physical proximity, but spiritual proximity. But here's a part of it you may not have noticed. This persists in the next world. I remember I gave a talk and I was talking about this and, and one Baha'i friend said, but it says we'll attain the presence of God in a form that befits you know, what we've attained. And, and another Baha'i said, how can there be presence? There's no physical reality. So what does it mean? Well, what's interesting is this. We will have experience of God's spirit through his prophets in the next world. But God is too great for us to know without this intermediary. The prophets know God, but how is more than human souls can grasp? So in other words, this intermediary teaching device persists even in the next world. And so if we construct the causal relationships, beginning with the, 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 the emanation from the, the, the first mind of the wish to be known, we get this. From the unknown essence of God emanates the primal wish or will of God by means of the Holy Spirit that conveys this wish to the preexistent manifestation who determines to assume the guise of a human persona, that he might exemplify godliness in his person and actions and provide laws and guidance for our creative action. So we can progress in our love relationship with God. Now, I'm gonna take just a few minutes and go through this quickly uh, so that you can uh, relax and so on. I'll. Uh, be somewhere if you have questions. Uh, I don't know, Mehran, if, if, what did we decide about that? Don't, uh, well, at any rate, we'll figure that out later. Um, now we've, we've done the collectivity of humankind, the intermediate relationship. Let's quickly look at the personal relationship. Three stages of the conscious self. Prenatal, when we're in physical association relationship, post-associational uh, clarity. We're in the world of vision. Stage one, before incarnation. That's a baby smiling in the womb. Why is it smiling? Well, <laughs> because it doesn't have to go through all the stuff we go through every day, I guess, uh, I don't know. But suffice it to say, and I have to say, Farid, that your dear wife, uh, Faranak, at the course at Lou Helen I taught, said, well, I think the baby has free will in the womb. And I thought, I never thought of that. You know, I don't remember my free will in the womb, but you know, I know my son did a, a complete knot in his uterus, I mean, in, a, in the umbilicus. And the, you know, the doctor, after he delivered James, said, you want this? Like it was a, you know, was a, uh, uh, an umbilical cord with a true knot in it, you know, not a kink, but a knot, you know, and I thought, you know, what is he, sick or something, you know? <laughs> For one thing, uh, that caused us to have to have about two stress tests to be sure he was getting enough blood because he had tied a knot in his umbilicus, so I, I wasn't pleased at all. Well, at any rate, we come up with this question, again, these crucial questions for which we have to, as Baha'i scholars, 
construct bridges to the answers. We know the answer. We know the answer. But unless we can convince others by constructing logical arguments, what good are we? The brain. Three pounds of electrified meat <laughs> are the repository of the conscious mind. It's an incredibly complex, it is the most complex thing in creation. And in my book, I go into a great deal of detail about brain theory and why, how the brain acts as the intermediary between our soul and our body. And so you get this, the brain made of 150 billions of these. I don't know why that got there. Uh, now, why is this here? Hold on one second. Oh, okay. So we can construct a similar paradigm of a top-down view. We have the soul. We have the intermediary of the rational faculty, which emanates from the soul, and which during its associational relationship with the brain or through the brain to the body, is relating to the body through the brain, but it's not dependent on the brain, you understand. As soon as the brain is rendered uh, inadequate to become a functioning intermediary, the conscious mind is free to be in the world of vision, but it's still conscious. And so if you have transparency, as you did with the perfect mirror, then what you see... Hello, I'm up behind is what you get. Hello, I'm up a high. <laughs> now, that's if the brain is wired correctly, you don't have any emotional illnesses or physical illnesses, you're in good health. Basically, that's what we aim for, but it's never perfect. Now, if you don't feel like yourself sometimes, <laughs> uh, you get a distortion a distorted image of what's what's happening in your soul, and so Hello. where you, I'm up a high. You get, <laughs> now this is if you get hit in the head hard, or you just uh, you know ate too much sugar or something. <laughs> now this is the delusional self, where the brain is not transparent because of some chemical imbalance. Hello, I'm up a high. Hello, I'm Johnny Cash. <laughs> That's my favorite. Let me tell you. Right. Hello, I'm Johnny Cash. <laughs> All right. And now, what we've got here is what I call in the book, the periscopic view of reality. And this is kind of the end of where we're going with this. It's a simple metaphor, but I think it works very well. It means so long as this associative, uh, associational or associative relationship endures, that you can affect the ability of yourself to understand yourself through some defect or malfunction in the brain. So not only is your ability to communicate with others encumbered, but your own ability to understand yourself is encumbered. But we know for a fact that the self, the essential self, the soul, is not affected. So, If you think of the brain as a milk carton taped together with an orange juice carton and you've got a homemade periscope, then the soul, from the soul emanates the mind, the conscious self. But during its associational or associative relationship, it must deal with reality through that brain. In other words, you can't separate yourself unless you're having an out-of-body experience from this relationship. So the conscious mind is not really aware of the soul. It's only aware of itself. 
And so it may get information indirectly, inductively through the senses. The information arrives in the conscious mind. You retain it. You decide what to do about it. Or you may be inspired. You may receive information directly from the realm of the spirit. All right, through prayer, through reflection, through meditation. It's still going to end up in the same place, in the conscious mind, so long as the brain is in an associative relationship. So you're still not aware of the soul. So whether the information comes to you in a dream or through prayer or through study of the writings, you're still, it's in the same place, your conscious mind. And you've still got to evaluate it and decide what you do with it, so long as you're in this associative relationship. As I said, this same process is happening right now with you and me. Um, finally, with a healthy brain, you have the powers of the soul, some of which are reason, will, self, self-consciousness, ideation, memory, emotion. Emotion is a product of the soul. It's transmitted through the chemistry of the brain and you can make somebody happy by giving them a lot of endorphins. But, well, let's not get into that. Read the book, read the book. <laughs> but that's a healthy brain and a healthy body. The Latin phrase, men sana in corpore sano, transparency. But if things get screwed up, bad, then all of these capacities seem to disappear. Someone with Alzheimer's, someone with dementia, someone with a physical traumatic injury, they seem to disappear as personalities, as people we know. And so their own conscious self also disappears. And you'll get this report. It's sad, but it's true. From the Holy Body Shop. We can find absolutely nothing wrong with your soul or its powers and faculties. We can only conclude your temple has been totaled. Sorry, but as you know, we are not allowed to do reincarnations. <laughs> and then stage three, where you're released from that associative relationship and you're in the world of vision. And all of these powers are now apparent again. In the twinkling of an eye, Baha'u'llah says this happens. As soon as that relationship suffers, that happens. Right? We had some discussion at Lou Helen when I gave a course on this a couple of weeks ago of people relating experiences, uh, oh, never mind, out-of-body experiences and so on. Very interesting. Well, this gives us a few additions, and this is the final paradigm. We go from the unknowable essence of God, so on, so on, so on, and we add to it the intermediary of the human brain, so long as the human soul is in an associative relationship with the human body. The hure of the veil between our conscious, consciousness and metaphysical reality during an associative, associational period of existence. This is a lovely, lovely quote. Didst thou behold immortal sovereignty, thou wouldst strive to pass from this fleeting world, but to conceal the one from thee and to reveal the other is a mystery which none but the pure in heart can comprehend. And of course, you're all familiar, I know, with the story of the individual who asked Baha'u'llah for the boon of being able to see the next world. It's authenticated the story. And Baha'u'llah said it wouldn't be good for you to do that. And he insisted, so Baha'u'llah said, okay, and showed him a glimpse of the next world, and he immediately killed himself. True story. Well, what is immortal sovereignty? All right. I'm sorry, this is messing up here. That's immortal sovereignty. That's the big bang from God's point of view. there's one big bang, there's got to be a bunch of big bangs. We're looking at one big bang from inside it. Outside it, if you've got infinite 
space, there's other big bangs going on, right? There's probably glimpses of big bangs. You know, I've invented the glump in my book. <laughs> I'll be famous someday for inventing the glump. And finally, in addition to the view of the cosmic celestial reality from God's point of view, we have the end of mortal sovereignty, which is not so impressive. Come on, computer, do your thing. Mon Dieu, qu'est-ce que c'est? Hello, I'm Johnny Cash. Thank <laughs> you.